So Lucy, why did you decide to write your book, Matrescence? Well, thank you. Thank you for having me and for asking me um, to talk about matrescence. I, um, my experience of becoming a mother was one of great astonishment and shock. Um, I was amazed, firstly, by how much harder the work of caregiving was. Um, I was amazed by my beautiful baby. But I was especially bowled over by the the sense of metamorphosis and that I was a different person. I'd been led to believe that pregnancy, childbirth and early motherhood would be a kind of external and environmental change. Um, but actually it was the most, well, physical, but psychological, emotional, mental, social, existential, experience of my life um as the months went on as my daughter was growing I felt kind of uh, strangely altered and rewired and as a journalist who writes about science and health I was interested fascinated in what was happening to me and um I started to read about the science of the maternal brain the science of hormones um what actually happens uh, in in that that period, and at the same time, I was really struggling. Um, I thought that maybe there was something wrong with me to be feeling so kind of discombobulated and bewildered. Um, I found sleep deprivation very difficult. I found the birth um, a, a huge shock. Um, I found breastfeeding very difficult. All these. Um, areas that I felt that I'd been kind of sold that would be instinctual or natural um and and as time went on the loneliness and the isolation and and the various kind of difficulties really impacted my mood um and then I discovered this word matrescence I think my daughter was about nine months or so um and I was very very lonely, very tired, very strung out. I felt quite kind of abandoned, to be honest, by, you know, I have a very loving family, a very supportive marriage. But I was, as most women are in, in kind of the global North and in, in Western culture alone every day with a young baby. Um, and I had been diagnosed with postnatal depression um, and I was just trying to work out of what, what was going on with me. and. I, I happened upon this word matrescence and it just was transformative for me. It was like a light bulb moment. So matrescence means um, the process of becoming a mother. It was coined in the 1970s by Dana Raphael, the late anthropologist, a long time ago. Maybe we'll talk about that. It's quite interesting how it's slightly lame dormant. Um, and it just brought together everything that I was feeling, kind of seeing, that actually this experience was in, in most other cultures in the world seen as a major existential crisis, a, a huge transition where there would be special social rites and rituals and, and so on. And, and I just found it so incredibly helpful and a really um, interesting frame as well that it it, it kind of propelled me to want to write a book about it and spend a number of years researching you know what happens when we become mothers and and why are so many mothers in a feeling crisis and, and struggling do you feel that expectations were different for your mother's generation um well i i always I kind of laugh and my mum, I was talking to my mum about what were the big parenting books when she was having me. And you know, I got into a complete tizzy with parenting books in my early months of motherhood. You know, the baby could, wouldn't sleep, couldn't seem to get her to sleep much at all. I couldn't breastfeed. I didn't know what I was doing wrong. Um, eventually I found out that I, I just have a condition where I couldn't make enough milk, um, felt terribly guilty uh for for that anyway got into this kind of um obsession of of trying to read all the books to tell me what to do and and i 
I, I'm, I asked her what her kind of most popular book, and this was the eight, mid eighties, and it was how not to be a perfect mother. Um, I think that's very interesting because it's really not like that today. You know, the expectations on on mothers have never been more intensive. Um, and I think while there were definitely pressures as there have been in a patriarchal post-industrial society, um, I don't think that, like my, I was born on pethidin, for example. So my mum had, you know, a, a, a painkiller to, to give birth to me. Whereas I felt um, that I was being told that should I use pain relief, it would be a failing. Um, and so I think there are some, there are some strangely oppressive norms um, in terms of expectations on women and mothers that are almost more oppressive than they were um, when my mother was having me in the 1980s. I mean, saying that as well, we are, m women are becoming mothers at such a, um, a time of like a great coalescence of, of different, different kind of social factors. So my mum did work, she was a, was a teacher, but um, you know, lots of mothers in that, that age wouldn't, wouldn't have worked. Um, whereas, you know, I, I was very privileged. I was, I was sent to university. I was told I could be anything. Um, you know, I, I really, I really uh, benefited from independence in my teens and twenties traveling. You know, I was really told, you know, you can be like a man, you can earn like a man, you can, you can do what you want. Um, and so I think that freedom then kind of slamming shut in motherhood in a way that um, was kind of unexpected is perhaps more, uh, more intense for people, for women today. That's my sense, you know, that the, 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 the contrast between the autonomy that we prize and the kind of hyper individualism and then the the extreme kind of vulnerability of a newborn and a new mother and the interdependence of that, it just clashes even more, even more intensely, I think, than it perhaps did then. Do you feel that new mothers are afraid to talk about the way they feel and the way that you just have been and you and you have so well in your book? Um, I mean, I certainly did. And um I think for a variety of different reasons, there is still lots of taboos. I mean, I think the you know, the main one is that people don't want to feel, don't want people to think that they don't love their children. And there is this sense that if you um, talk honestly about the huge spectrum of emotions that you will, might go through as a mother, you know, in a day of caregiving, that if any of those are negative, that it, it means that you don't love your children and that no one wants you know, no one wants to anyone to think that of them, and 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 as a society, I think you know we we love. Well, I don't think we actually, you know, support children in our society. But you know, there is also, I think, a fear of, um, you know, if I talk honestly about how I feel, will I get a black mark, and will like social services turn up, or um, and, and I think that is particularly in a. And there's a there's a, a writer called Sandra Igwe who who runs the motherhood group um, for for black women in London and you know that's certainly a a fear in different um, ethnic groups of of being a kind of stigma and and discrimination um, and I think that perhaps so I had my first child in 2016 and I think in the last few years it does feel like there's more opening up of discourse in the more, the more of the mainstream about kind of authentic portrayals of motherhood um, on this, on, in television and kind of motherland and films like Tully, um, novels like um, Night Bitch. Sorry, are we allowed to swear? That's, that's <laughs> name of um, and of course, I mean, uh, what I found was actually a lot of the writing and the voices that I turned to were, were kind of, you know, feminists from the 70s and 80s, like Adrian Rich and, um, you know, lots of lots of women who were kind of writing then, 
but then there seems to have been this um this this kind of silencing really of kind of honest motherhood which seemed to perhaps correlate with a liberal feminism which was more concerned in you know smashing the glass ceiling leaning in being a girl boss that kind of thing where the maternal was kind of ignored or neglected or you know occluded and, and perhaps that's changing now um I certainly felt that in my own matrescence once I felt I could be honest about you know sometimes how awful I felt and how you know all the emotions you know anger kind of at, at certain parts of the healthcare system at the myths at the the oppressive expectations once I found people that I could really be honest with that that was kind of the ultimate soothing balm um also you know I've, I've had a different types of therapy as well that's been very helpful but um yeah I have a whatsapp group with a couple of friends and, and we can just say whatever we 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 feel and that that's been really crucial it, it took me a while to find but it's been really important I did wonder whether you felt that social media and and sort of you know happy smiley photographs might be possibly part of the issue that makes people continue to think every day must be perfect and and um you know that good enough is simply uh not a message that anybody would want to to you know express absolutely and you know the data backs that that up there is this um this this a sense of intensive motherhood to use Sharon Hayes threat, um, phrase to describe the the very kind of resource intensive time intensive emotionally um, intelligent kind of parenting that is culturally accepted um, required today um, and yeah the data shows that social media is very full of that and that it unsurprisingly affects people's mental health. Um, negatively because of, of comparisons I don't really follow any of that because I tend to follow the more kind of honest motherhood um, but I, I'm, I'm sure that absolutely feeds into it the sense that you know if someone's um, posting pictures of you know it all looking pastel hued and rosy mm -hmm. and, and that was absolutely my impression of um, motherhood before my own matrescence was this kind of calm tranquil almost banal which is absolutely not I think it's so interesting experience when the reality was wild and you know just so edgy and heady and and kind of powerful and awful and intense um so yes social media doesn't help but I'm 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 excited to see a lot more voices being you know being heard yeah. of the, the complexity emotional complexity um birth of course can be traumatic but women are as you say largely not told that but what do you think you know how can we deal better with that initial step of becoming a mother mm, that's such a big question such an important one because it's the beginning um there are so many ways to answer that question. Um, and, you know, my book is, is very particularly about my own kind of experiences. And, but there are certain things that I do seem to see across the board. And, and I suppose one of them is a sense, which probably is partly well-intentioned. Um, and and some women in their pregnancies do want to have a filter and, and not hear you know anything negative but I don't think that we're given enough information about um, all the risks and the realities of birth um, and that might come from a kind of um, you know an intention to be kind and not to scare women but actually um, I think you know, and, and I, I interviewed a consultant gynecologist for my book, and I, it, I, th I think most women want to know, want to know what could happen to their bodies mm. and what it might be like. And um, there seems to be a, um, a presentation of ideal birth at the moment. You know, we've seen where that has got, you know, 
places you know in the last kind of 10 years with the Ockenden report mm -hmm. and you know I'm, I'm again I, I, I can see how the um, desire to kind of sacralize birth and to to make it into the most natural process as possible is attractive but I think we forget that nature is um, you know is big tears and nature is women dying in childbirth for a long time and nature is prolapse and you know actually it's there's a lot going on there that I think women would really benefit from knowing more about antenatally and then in the postnatal period um I think we need more investment in in maternity and healthcare in in knowledge um uh and also kind of thinking more about women's mental health. I'm, I'm very um, interested in seeing these mental health hubs that are starting to, to open up, I think, across the UK and pelvic, pelvic health centres as well. So that's really great. Um, but I think, yeah, my experience was one of, you know, expecting it to be a kind of 12 hour labour, pretty, you know, if I did my exercises and my breathing and, you know, all that stuff I wouldn't feel too much pain and that was that wasn't my experience um and I think there is this move away from you know wanting you know wanting to protect women from feeling like failures if they don't achieve this kind of ideal birth mm -hmm. and that I just think we just need to keep doing that moving away from that challenging it mm -hmm. um and also I think you know acknowledging how big it is however you give birth um, you know, in, in in other cultures, in other countries, women after giving birth are, you know, you know, they have their bellies wrapped or they have special soups and powders and, you know, oils and massages and they are looked after. Um, and, you know, I know we, we really prize our privacy and our autonomy and our independence in our culture, but I wonder if there is a way of, in some way, um, you know really centering the woman as well as the baby so they are really cared for as well um you you write about um being treated for postnatal depression do do you think that it is uh well understood and treated in this country i think it's really surprised me how actually when i talk about postnatal depression or when often people will equate postnatal depression with um, not being attached or not bonding with your baby or like not liking your baby. Um, and that, that surprises me. That still seems to be, you know, what, what, what it's equated with. And obviously, you know, there are bonding and attachment issues that, that women can have and, and, and be treated for. But I just, I think that it's quite a blunt um, understanding when actually um, I think the the emotional experience um, postnatally for women can be so so very complex. I was diagnosed with postnatal depression. Looking back, I think it probably was more postnatal anxiety. Um, I've had I'd had um, periods of depression, anxiety in the past, um, and I was glad that I responded well to antidepressants and and therapy. Um, uh, and I kind of think about it a bit like a wound that gets infected, um, postnatal depression and mm, depression really. So for me, I think that there was this kind of ca catastrophe almost in my life of having a baby, which I was so pleased and I love her so much, but it was a crisis. And, and in modern motherhood today, you know, you're left alone. Uh, pre pretty much um, there's all this physical change there's these huge brain changes which make the brain so vulnerable um, because it has to change in order to care for the baby but that you know makes it vulnerable to 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 ill health and and for me I think then the wound which possibly could have I wonder if you know it's possible that I would have become depressed anyway because of the hormonal changes but I think that it tip can tip into it certainly for me tipped into a kind of more clinical um, situation 
in a way that the wound gets infected, if you see what I mean, and then it needs to be treated in a different way. Um, and one of the questions I wanted to try and answer, which was impossible really in my book, was you know how much of maternal mental illness could be prevented through um, different ways of supporting women and caring for women and, and social support structures. And you know, I talked to um, neuroscientists and psychiatrists, and you know, there are these seismic hormonal changes through pregnancy. You know, some some hormone that hormones changing by 200 300 times you know there's never going to be not the possibility of um some form of illness um for some women you know that that seems to be given but also i think there are ways of there are, do seem to be ways of using social support to really help women in that in that period and you know, while I was grateful to be given a prescription for antidepressants, I'm very grateful to antidepressants. They have helped me through my life. You know, perhaps it was, um, you know, addressing the symptom rather than the cause. Um, I think there could be a more biopsychosocial, holistic way, you know, it's idealistic perhaps, but way of looking at, you know, what, what's happening in that, in that transition what, and what do women need. Okay, Lucy, that's terrific. I have to say that your book is a fantastic read, um, you know, filled with uh, quite extraordinary facts and also your own story, but it's, it's, uh, I think it will do very well. And I'd really urge new mothers uh, to read it. And we've, we've named it the well doing book of the month. So congratulations for that. Thank you so much. Okay.